Hey, good morning everybody. Welcome back to a full week of virtual programming here at the Old Baldy Foundation. My name is Travis Gilbert. I'm the Educator and Collections Coordinator here at the Old Baldy Foundation. And we're so thankful and glad that you can join us this morning for this edition of Quarantine Collections. I have uh, pulled out some a really special piece of collections uh, that I'm going to share with you this morning. I've kind of been saving it for uh, the tail end because it is um, really a special piece and those of us at the Old Baldy Foundation hold it dear and it very much is an impressive piece when you visit uh, Old Baldy Lighthouse. So I'm hoping everybody out there is healthy and that you all are staying positive. I know it's Tuesday morning but it is my Monday morning so I wanted to do uh, Hope that you all wish you all had a um, wonderful weekend. I know I sure did. It feels just like summer here on Bald Head Island. Uh, today, I woke up and for the first time, I just had that feeling that, ooh, summer is right around the corner. And of course, we're approaching May. Uh, it's hard to believe when I started um, quarantining out here, it was March. Uh, so, <laughs> time sure does fly when you're having fun, right? So those of you out there listening, I'd love to hear from you. Give me a shout out in the comments, drop us a line, let us know where you're listening from and your connection to Baldhead Island. Let me know y'all are healthy and positive out there. I'd love to hear from you as we get started here this morning. Uh, this morning I wanted to share with you all what we call the, the Rosa de Beldo rudder. It's a, a Spanish rudder from a ship that was uncovered just offshore of Bald Head Island's South Beach. And it sits or it rests on display in the base of Old Baldy Lighthouse. Uh, it sits in there on display. It's mounted just underneath the stairwell. And it very much is an impressive piece. It kind of overshadows nearly everything in the base of the lighthouse. It's that large and la that tall. It's kind of overpowering in that space. And it really hearkens uh, folks or visitors back to the idea of the purpose of lighthouses. And this idea, it's a reminder as you're climbing that lighthouse, just where Bald Head Island sits in this graveyard of the Atlantic. This term uh, created by historian David Stick when he wrote a book called The Graveyard of the Atlantic. And it's describing this coastline between Cape Fear here in the south on Bald Head Island and Cape Hatteras to our north, which is the northern terminus of the graveyard of the Atlantic. And of course, Cape Lookout is there in between. There are no less than 2,000 shipwrecks in this graveyard of the Atlantic. Uh, brothers and sisters, I guess all ships are, are she's, uh, so sisters of the Rosa who rest at the bottom of uh, the sand at the graveyard of the Atlantic. And you got to wonder why are there so many shipwrecks like the Rosa just offshore of Bald Head Island and along North Carolina's shoreline, the Hoy to our north at Cape Hatteras. And it's because of where the Gulf Stream sits just offshore. Uh, these ship captains, especially in the age of sail, and even after the age of sail, they would use the Gulf Stream, this warm water current that goes offshore of North America's eastern seaboard in a northern direction. It's like an oceanic highway. I mean, of course, you can propel your journey via sail. You, of course, with the power of wind, you could propel your journey via steam, burning coal, uh, a combination of both. But why would you not use the currents of the Gulf Stream to kind of give you a kickstart, you know, add a little extra juice to your journey? Of course, you have the power of sail, you have the power of steam, but when you combine those forms of energy with this natural form of energy, this current that drives northward along the eastern seaboard, it's like a great gift. You can go much faster. And that Gulf Stream, that oceanic highway, 
that Route 40, you're from this area, that Route 40 out on the Atlantic, goes right past Bald Head Island. Now, it does take several hours to get out to the Gulf Stream from Southport, uh, Moorhead City up towards Cape Lookout's a little closer, and Cape Hatteras is, is even closer. Uh, so, it, you know, it's several hours off of our coastline to go out and reach the Gulf Stream, but it's within striking distance. You can fish in the Gulf Stream waters uh, from a home base in Southport or Wilmington or Wrightsville Beach. It's within striking range. It's within uh, our kind of purview. So, so many of these ships use that Gulf Stream, whether they were going in between ports from the Caribbean to Europe, or whether they were domestic ports, you know, working themselves up and down the eastern seaboard. Uh, they used that oceanic highway, and that oceanic highway went right past Bald Head Island. So, of course, with such a high concentration of ships traveling on the Gulf Stream past Bald Head Island, you're going to increase your likelihood of shipwrecks, accidents to occur. And that is just what happened with the Rosa. Uh, the Rosa was a Spanish merchant vessel and she was coming from Havana, all right, in November of 1804. She was traveling from Cuba back to Spain and we believe that she had a, a cargo of sugar on board. Makes sense from Cuba. So you might ask, well, what's a ship from Cuba doing off the North Carolina coastline after going back to Spain? Well, it's this kind of uh, a very simplistic way of looking at it is what we call the triangular trade. And it involves one of the uh, three sides of that triangle is that Gulf Stream. So ships, when they uh, wanted to travel from Europe into the Caribbean or into North America, they didn't just sail straight across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I imagine some of them did. Uh, much smarter people out there could illuminate on that. But a majority of these ships would use uh, kind of the three sides of a triangle. The first side, the first leg of that journey, would be traveling from Europe down southward, down along the coast of Africa, to let's say like the Canary Islands or the Verde Islands. And from there, there was this natural wind called the trade winds. And that wind would propel their journey across the Atlantic Ocean and dump them out into the Caribbean. And from the Caribbean, they could pick up the Gulf Stream waters in between the coast of Florida and the coast of the Bahamas. And that would propel their journey up along the eastern seaboard of the current United States in a northern direction. And eventually the Gulf Stream works itself from a northern direction to really a northeastern direction. And that would propel their journey back to Europe using another wind called the, uh, the westerlies. So this triangular trade, if you will, kind of propelled their journey. They used and harnessed the energies of Mother Nature, whether it be the winds or whether it be these currents or streams within the ocean, to assist themselves, to give them a leg up in their journeys. It became known as the triangular trade because that was roughly the shape, but additionally, these merchant men created a trade system that kind of, um, piggybacked on whatever goods they could find in each of the legs of their journeys. So they would take manufactured goods, like guns, alcohol, take them to Africa. From Africa, they would pick up enslaved persons and take them over to the Caribbean. From the Caribbean, they would pick up um, sugar, uh, it, you know, goods, raw agricultural goods, uh, molasses, etc. that were found in the Caribbean and take them up to the United States where they would, or the colonies even, before the United States, and they would trade all that sugar, molasses, whatever in the United States for more uh, raw materials, 
uh, agricultural goods that were in demand from Europe. So not only are these merchant men like the La Rosa using and harnessing the powers of Mother Nature to propel their journeys, additionally they're capitalizing on the goods and the materials found in each of these legs of their journeys and moving those goods to the next stop, the next leg, the next side of the triangle in this triangular trade. Very simplistic way of looking at it, folks, uh, but uh, it kind of gives you an idea of why so many shipwrecks, so many ships like the La Rosa, Spanish merchant vessel, would be found here just offshore of Bald Head Island. Emmeline, uh, how much exploration is done in this graveyard? Uh, lots of exploration, Emmeline. We're very fortunate uh, that the Underwater Archaeology Unit for the state of North Carolina is just north of us at Fort Fisher. And they, uh, those underwater archaeologists, uh, kind of are a catalyst for much of this research and much of this exploration in the graveyard of the Atlantic. There are certainly shipwrecks out there that have not been explored, that, not ha that have not been mapped. Uh, I will let you know that up in Curie Beach, uh, the Condor, which is a blockade runner that wrecked just offshore of Curie Beach during the American Civil War, uh, they now have set up buoys and balloons where you can dive or snorkel to the site. It's the first, they kind of coined it as the first um, underwater cultural, uh, cultural um, historic site, I, uh, give or take. <laughs> but this idea is they're trying to get folks, normal people, not underwater archaeologists, not divers, just more normal people that would go to a historic site like a museum, and they're trying to now get them to go out and uh, hook up to these buoys on a kayak or whatever, surfboard, and uh, go snorkeling or go di free diving down and explore this remains, uh, trying to uh, bring awareness, bring heritage tourists, uh, one of my favorite terms, uh, to this underwater site. Um, I think that there are a lot of limitations in this area because the water uh, is certainly not as clear as down the Caribbean, um, but certainly many of the sites have been explored. And uh, good morning, Kathy Gilward. Uh, it's great to hear from you. If you're out there listening, uh, give us a drop in the comments. Drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you out there. So the La Rosa is a Spanish merchant ship. She was traveling from Cuba with a cargo of rum, a cargo, excuse me, of sugar, not rum, a cargo of sugar from Cuba, heading back to Spain. And in November of 1804, she wrecks off of South Beach, just offshore of Bald Head Island. So her crew members were eventually saved and interrogated at Fort Johnston, which is the fort that is located in modern day downtown Southport today. It is from the uh, garrison, from the soldiers of Fort Johnson, that we learn that the captain and the first mate are not on board. And this arouses some suspicion from the commander at Fort Johnson, which is a gentleman uh, named J Captain, oh, I think he's a lieutenant at this point, uh, but his name is Joseph Gardner um, Swift. And we've heard this name before. Uh, this is a name that's common to the story of Bald Head Island. Uh, Smithville's still here. Hey, good morning, Phil. <laughs> Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, we, we know about uh, Joseph Gardner Swift because he very much befriends Benjamin Smith and he befriends... Uh, uh, mm. Somebody is at the door here. I'm hoping that they're going to go away. Uh, Joseph Gardner Swift, uh, he, pardon me, y'all folks. You never know what's going to happen live, folks. <laughs> but
but the uh, name Joseph Gardner Smith is Swift is familiar to you all because he befriends Benjamin Smith and his wife Sarah Dry Smith uh, when he is stationed here at Fort Johnston as commander of the fort. He comes to Fort Johnston because he's an engineer. He's one of the first graduates at West Point, the military academy. And he comes to Fort Johnston because uh, we need to recreate this fort. The fort was destroyed or burned by Patriot militia or troops during the American Revolution. And then in this early years of the Republic, there were so many war scares with European powers, specifically France and specifically England, uh, the North Carolina legislature, the General Assembly, uh, they keep petitioning the federal government that we need some sort of fortification to defend the mouth of the Cape Fear River. It had been attacked by Spanish um, pirates or privateers in the 1740s. Again, it was attacked by the British during the American Revolution. We need some sort of defense system. So they send this gentleman, uh, Joseph Gardner Swift. And uh, he really becomes a figure in the Lower Cape Fear region's culture. Uh, he befriends Benjamin Smith. He frequents Baldhead Island. So his story kind of permeates many of our stories here on Baldhead Island, whether it's the creation of the original lighthouse, whether it's the story of Benjamin Smith, who owned Baldhead Island during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the establishment of Old Baldy Lighthouse, the harvesting of the wood here, uh, to create uh, the Navy, the original Navy United States. Never really happens, but it's a, it's a great idea. So his story eventually comes back to us, or it permeates this connection to Baldhead Island as well, is he's the commandant at Fort Johnston when the La Rosa crashes ground on South Beach in November of 1804. And he, uh, the, the pilots from Southport rescue the crew they take them back to Southport, and that's when everybody starts to get su uh, suspicious. Why is the captain, why is the first mate, why are they nowhere to be found? And then eventually they find gold coins wrapped in the crew member's sashes. So very clearly, there is some suspicious activity going on here. Where is the captain, where is the first mate, and why are you all, why are you all hiding money in the sashes of your uniform? Good morning, Barry. It's great to hear from you. Uh, so I'm going to read here uh, the, this resource, this primary resource from Mr. Swift's memoirs. It says, At the close of the month of November, a large Spanish ship called the Bilbo was cast away on Cape Fear in a storm. It was alleged by the crew who were brought by Pilot Davis to my quarters, that the ship was laden with sugar and that there was much money in the run, that the captain and the mate had died at sea and that having no navigator on board, they had to put the ship before the wind and run her on shore near the Cape. There were 21 in the crew, a villainous set of looking rascals, that I had no doubt that they were. Lieutenant Fergus detained them in the blockhouse at the fort until the collector sent inspectors to conduct the crew to Charleston, where the ship was known to some merchant. These men all had more or less of dollars in their red woolen sashes tied around their waists. On their arrival in Charleston, they were detained some time, but no proof could be found against them, and they were set free. The pilots and others were for some time after this exploring the remains of the wreck, but there was no valuables found among the drift, save spars and safe rigging. So a nice little resource, a villainous set of rascals. I love that quote. Uh, he really uh, wasn't giving them the benefit of the doubt. So they're taken to Charleston and they're eventually acquitted. But the, uh, the, the Rosa sits offshore of Baldhead Island until the late 1980s, when salvagers, under the direction of several local historians here and underwater archaeologists, and the behests of the Mitchell family, uh, who have purchased Baldhead Island in the year 1983, develop it, or finish the job here, developing into what we know as Baldhead Island today, they seek to go down and just like the men in the uh, late 1804 time period, gonna get out and see what was left behind from the La Rosa. So I, I brought up uh, a uh, 
newspaper article it says murky deep off bald head yields ancient ship's rudder it says here the rudder that sank to the bottom of the atlantic ocean with the spanish galleon in 1804 submerged friday in what appeared to be remarkably good shape diver dennison breeze with his crew had barely been able to see the 16 by 3 foot rudder 20 feet below the surface during the last two weeks of excavations as a crane and barge gently deposited the rudder at the Baltic Island Marina at noon, crew members remarked how solid the rudder of the La Rosa de Babo had remained after spending 183 years among salt, sand, and other undersea attackers. It looks great, doesn't it? said Brees. It's in good shape. Look at this copper. Brees said the rudder, four inches thick and tapered at one end, was probably double coated with lead for protection. The nail sheeting and straps were made of copper, he said. Engineer and crew member Charlie Brown said the rudder appeared to be made of oak and yellow pine. It was indeed made out of yellow pine. We have a letter uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Forest Service and the Underwater Archaeology Unit at Cree Beach. They sent a sample of the rudder to the Forest Department to determine what wood was made, uh, what um, wood constituted the rudder, and of course it was yellow pine. And they are correct. Uh, the nails and the sheathing were made of copper, and then the entire rudder was painted, uh, was coated with lead, and that was to prevent any kind of worms from boring into the rudder and destroying the water by uh, rudder by eating it. Uh, many many ships in this area uh, are succumbed to these worms eating at their hull. If you recall, the pirate Steve Bonnet was in the Lower Cape Fear region because he had to careen a ship, turn it over, and remove uh, the, the damaged wood from these worms. So, historically significant, the, the, the value of worms and their preventing of worms uh, has to kind of the history and the story of this, of this island. Uh, and curious enough, the copper, we have a lot of copper nails uh, that were uncovered in the 1986 archaeological dig here at the Lighthouse Grounds. And I find that curious because I, often people are like, why would you make a nail out of copper? It's such a, a soft metal. Um, and the archaeologists kind of inferred that it was from a shipyard that was located where the village chapel is today. That there was a shipyard in that saltwater marsh along the creeks. And uh, this is more evidence that suggests that, yes, those nails that were uncovered are from a shipyard because they're using copper nails in a rudder uh, from a, a very similar time period, certainly before uh, Old Bali Lighthouse. So curious uh, connection. Right. So uh, Kent Mitchell, who was the son of George Mitchell, who bought the island in uh, 1983, uh, they contributed $20,000 uh, for this project to uncover this rudder. And it was uh, uncovered or it was recovered by strategic salvers, uh, Denison, you were hearing quote, in November of 1987. Again, the dive was sponsored by the Mitchell family. It, the rudder was taken to the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources Underwater Archaeology Branch up at Fort Fisher where it was restored and then it was brought back here to Bald Head Island on a permanent loan placed inside the base of Old Baldy Lighthouse where it is on exhibit today. And just as they said, it is yellow um, pine. You can still see remains of the copper plating and the uh, lead plating that was uh, on top of the wood to protect it from the worms and from the harsh environment. Uh, it is a massive, as I say, it kind of overwhelms you uh, inside the lighthouse. It weighs an estimated 1,500 pounds and it is um, 16 feet tall. Uh, it, it's it's kind of miraculous uh, how the size of this rudder. Now there is a cannon that was uncovered as well. There is a cannon, and that cannon you can see at the uh, North Carolina Maritime Museum in Southport. You go on over to that museum when they open up. Inside their exhibit is a small cannon uh, that was uncovered during this dig. Uh, it is uh, originally was at the marina uh, for Bald Head Island. 
uh, but due to uh, its condition and they needed to place it in a more protected environment and more stable environment, uh, it was decided to move it over on permanent exhibit at the uh, North Carolina Maritime Museum. And this summer, uh, my counterpart Katie over there uh, worked with an intern from the University of North Carolina Wilmington and they created a new exhibit, a very much an interactive exhibit uh, for the canon. I had the uh, pleasure of going over there and uh, helping them at the tail end uh, critique this uh, exhibit and it is a job well done. It's really awesome. Uh, it, the exhibit, there are footprints around this canon from the La Rosa and you stand on the footprints and above the footprint, this, these are plated on the floor, you stand on the footprint and above it, it gives you a description of what role you would have had in the firing of that cannon if you stood where the footprints are. So it kind of helps describe how many people it would take to fire this cannon and what their individual roles were in firing the cannon and where that man or, or woman, I guess, would, would stand. Uh, so it's, it's a really cool exhibit and I encourage you not only to come over here and see our rudder uh, when, you, when we reopen, but also to go over and show some love to our counterparts at the Maritime Museum and to see the cannon there as well. So uh, I do, um, I'm going to give you a disclaimer here. I'm going to try to take you out and show you the cannon. Uh, the Wi-Fi and the cell service is awful in the base of the lighthouse. There's nothing we can do about it. It is simply because there are brick walls and they're very, very thick in the base of the lighthouse. Uh, that's how she stood for 200 some years. <laughs> uh, so it's great for the longevity of Old Baldy. It is terrible for trying to do Facebook Lives. So I cannot promise you that the Facebook Live is going to continue when I get in the base of the lighthouse, but we are going to give it our very best shot uh, so I can get you up close to the base of the lighthouse. If it proves to be unstable in there, I will post uh, several pictures in the comments here after we get off on Facebook Live. Uh, Patty Henson says, it is a rainy morning out there in Missouri. Good day to ha uh, learn a little history. Uh, well, Patty, thank you for joining us. Patty was telling me this weekend about uh, Outer Banks, and I must admit, Patty, I've heard great things, and I've heard bad things about it, but unfortunately, it was filmed down in Charleston. The lighthouse is Hunting Island, and uh, Morris Island appears, so not filmed in the Outer Banks. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of hoopla because they, uh, it seemed as if the characters had taken a ferry from the Outer Banks to uh, Chapel Hill. And that has caused all kinds of hoopla online because, as everybody knows, Chapel Hill's nowhere near the Outer Banks. <laughs> all right. So there we have old Baldy in all her glory this morning. But there is the rudder. can see 16 feet tall. And I should have described what a rudder is. A rudder, of course, uh, allows the ship to have direction. You, know, you move the rudder one way or another if you want to go to the left or to the right in the course of your travel. I'm going to refrain from using sailing terms and nautical terms because I just don't know them. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to sign off here. I want to thank you all for joining us for this edition of Quarantine Collections. Uh, we will be back this afternoon with an edition of Touring with Travis. So please join us this afternoon. I'm going to try to get closer to this rudder after I sign off for you. That's last little bit. Like I said, I can't promise that the Facebook Live uh, will work. So we thank you all for joining us this, this edition of Quarantine Collections. Uh, we're so thankful that you all could uh, be a part of this community as we're trying to provide a little history and a little bit of levity to a very distressing time in our country. So you all continue to stay positive out there, uh, stay healthy. We're hoping that everybody in your family is healthy and that you're safe. And from the bottom of our hearts, we really appreciate everything that the essential employees are doing to make our country kind of continue to chug along at best as we can. 
There's so many people out there that are going to work every day uh, to make sure that there are food on the shelves, that the sick are getting cared for, that the test and the vaccine is getting worked on. There's so many people out there um, that are putting themselves on the front lines, and we thank them uh, for everything that they're doing. And we thank you all for social distancing and doing your part and my small part uh, in this collective effort to stem the curve and uh, get life as we know it back to normal, hopefully someday soon. So let's check out this rudder. Can't promise that the Wi-Fi is going to work. And I'll see you all this afternoon.